Okay. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to Mooresville, our little chunk of North Carolina. Um, we're going to have a little discussion today. My name is Sean Pogue. This is Michael Neville. He's in charge of our grinding service. And we're sitting in front of our fantastic CNC grinder and um, coming from our grinding room here in the demo area. Uh, what we'd like to do today is just kind of open up for some discussions on types of knife steel. Uh, when do we apply what type? Um, Michael, I think I'll turn it over to you and, and you right. experience a lot of this through our grinding service. Thanks. And of course, excuse me, uh, any questions you guys have, fire them off. We have somebody uh, moderating our question line there and we'll, we'll get them taken care of. Great. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, one of the biggest questions I get asked in the grinding service daily almost is different types of knife steel and how they apply to different types of species of lumber. And in our tooling catalog, we have this great um, mm -hmm. recommendation chart that is on page 22. But this only includes a handful of these species. And oftentimes, um, we get asked questions about additional species that aren't here. And we just ask that you call in for those. But for example, um, everyone wants to know how long can they run a species of lumber with what type of steel. So we have various different types of steel here. And one of the bigger questions I get is, you know, how long is this going to run? And that's a difficult question to answer. It is very difficult. And a lot of times uh, Mike may come out and ask me a specific in uh, instance with a customer. And what's one of the first things I ask you? What's the grade of lumber? <laughs> we can't answer a, a specific length of time that a, a type of knife steel will last. Uh, per se, if I'm looking at something, you guys may know these terms, uh, uh, as an FAS and uh, ends up you're running one or two common. So there's gonna be a lot more um, uh, voids or knots, loose knots, grain transitions, things like that in those materials. So therefore it would shorten the length of a traditional sharpen on that knife. And so, you know, again, not an easy question. Um, and like Sean said, lots of factors come into play here. So a lot of times, you know, we have to ask these questions to our customers and really get in depth if they really want a, a, a valued, honest answer, a best suggestion. So on of all of these different types of steel here, um, let's talk about first about our entry level. Hang on, our, just a second, Mike. Sure. Where, where would the customer find this uh, online? This particular, this is in the tooling catalog. It's our 22nd edition and it is on our website. Um, it's the toolingwindingusa.com. So you can go in and find a link to this and this is downloadable. So you can uh, get this information, have it. There's a lot of other great resources in here as well that relate to the knife steel, which we'll talk about in just a bit. So this is for all you grinder guys. Make a copy of that, have the front office laminate it, keep it in your tool room. Very valuable, lots of good information in here. Um, so it's tool steel, mm -hmm. um, our SRS or economy grade steel, short run steel, it's a D2 based steel. Um, we don't use this a lot in the grinding service. Not a lot of customers use this. What, why, why would a customer choose that type of steel? Most of the time it's based off of two things, price and just a short run. Now, my question to that though for short run stuff is, I mean, it does, it, you can't use it on everything, obviously, sure. but a pretty wide range. Of so things maybe a, a, a test profile for a customer before they maybe get a big job, something like that. We're keeping the price of the material down because we know it's not going to be running production for us. Okay. All right. And then um, next thing we have up is, which is quite popular actually, is our, um, our M2. Yep. And um, a mm -hmm. lot of customers, mm -hmm. I think that, um, especially on the East Coast, that joint seem to really like the M2. Can you explain a little bit why uh, that is the case? Yeah, well, a lot of that, it all gets pretty deep. But the main thing is, is the, the folks that are running the high speeds and doing a lot of the jointing, um, they're usually running some form of finger jointed pine or pine itself, you know, radiata, whatever the case may be. And uh, it just reacts a little differently with pine. So same way with all you window guys, if you're watching, uh, we know that's a steel of choice for you guys, uh, just because of the types of pine that you're running in your windows. Okay. And what about outside of that? Most of my questions or customers that use that are primarily <clears throat> shorter run customers mm -hmm. um, that are really using that. Um, just their steel of choice. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And then next, the, uh, uh, if we back up oh, just a second, sure. that, so the, the M2, and this is going to segue into the next size or type, that the M2 is what Weinig used to have uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. It was a premier knife steel. You know, it was the thing everybody went to, whether you were joining, 
not joining, you know, that was the steel to use. It ground well, it ran well, gave us good length of run and stuff like that, which then brought us into how do we make the M2 better? And we started uh, using the M3 and we actually put the plus on the end because there's a different mixture on that for us and um, really bridged the gap in between the next type of harder steel to deal with. It was a little bit difficult to grind or harder to grind. Um, and the M3 was a really good balance between the two of those. Okay. And real quick with the M2, this is the only steel that we offer that's in quarter inch and 5 16 Okay. Yep. Um, so then that leads us into the M3, which this, I would say, is definitely uh, our best seller next to the Super 18 in the grinding service. Um, a lot of people are familiar with this steel and really like this steel. Yep. get very good results with it. Like I said, it's a good steel, uh, very even a little bit higher than a mid-range steel, but uh, it grinds very well. And you guys know... You spend some time in front of a grinder, you get a feel for how the grinding wheel acts on the knives steel. Uh, a lot of that has to do with, too, that you don't have excessive burning on the knives. Uh, yes, you need to keep the uh, coolant system flushing on the, the material while you're grinding it, but it grinds in a little softer, quicker way that uh, helps things break down easier and grinds faster. Okay, great. But still gives you a good tip on the production runs for a, a linear molding run. All right, um, next up, which this is also, like I said, one of the more common ones that we sell is the Supra 18. And when I started here in the grinding service, most of our regular customers, their steel of choice was the M3. Um, I started kind of pushing and promoting the Supra because the cost is pretty insignificant. It's just slightly more than the M3. And a lot of my customers that were using the M3 consistently, they would try the Super 18 one time and then say, okay, I want to use that unless I tell you otherwise. Oh, so there's a noticeable difference there because I'm getting the feedback. So that's a positive. Um, and I know that has more tungsten. Is there anything else about that particular steel or other uh, species? It's, again, it's just a little bit, um, I would say more brittle. You guys that do grind, you would feel a, a more brittleness to it. But what that is, is again, it's given us more of a certain material in there to help give us some density in the product to give you a good sharp tip, but still uh, carry on with a, a longer run than normal. And some of our customers from experience do have some success on short runs of MDF with that steel as yep. well. Yep. Yep. And that's a, a question that we get asked a lot too, um, customers that are, aren't familiar with MDF and would like to try to use high speed steel, in most cases can't, but if it's a short run, they can get away with it on that. So that nicely segues into, whoops, throwing stuff around, <laughs> here next. Piece into there. our DLC. And the DLC is a, mm -hmm. um, it's a coated steel. It's an M2 based steel, but it's coated. It's a diamond-like coating. Um, and it, it, it does offer um, some benefits in certain products. Um, we, it's also uh, got a coating on it that uh, it's a little, um, reduces the heat, I guess, in a, a little more, gives you a little more longevity yeah it's again all of these steels kind of step in between each other as bridges to the next um, phase or type of steel that you'd be using of course that depends on your end product um, so looking at the dlc uh, or the coated steels um, it is a softer steel the actual base of the material is clear back to an m2 but you have to have a soft enough steel for the coating to actually penetrate the surface of the material so it's not just flaking off during your runs or you know when you're grinding that's dragging across the tool rest, those kind of things. So a lot of times I do know that people will use that coated steel. Again, it's a um, they may be putting in for a job, it's a great big production run with some large facility, but they don't want to invest in um, all of the tooling at once and it could even be MDF. And that's enough to get through a pretty good, good decent run, not the normal type of run for MDF, but enough to get the samples out to the customers and, and then be ready to move on to the next type. <laughs> so up next, we jump up to carbide and we've got two different types of carbide here. We'll talk about the TCT inlay carbide first, which is a one piece knife and it has uh, the carbide is brazed um, to, the, to the steel. Yep. Um, the TCT works <clears throat> well in my experience with my customers. A lot of people that run um, soft maple have really good luck with this. Um, also some MDF, um, there's a lot of various uses for this and it, it does offer quite a bit longer lineal footage runs than the steel. So the typical question I ask these guys whenever they come out and say, hey, we got this customer, blah, 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 and they want to use the inlaid carbide or I'm not sure to go to double back carbide, 
What's my first question? Have they run it before? <laughs> and do they have knots? Yes. So the main reason is, um, again, we're talking about the, I don't know if you can see this in the camera, but there's a laminated piece of carbide on top of a piece of uh, high-speed steel. Again, it's got to be a soft enough steel, the brazing grabs and hold the material in place. But what this is used for is it's a little softer graded carbide, and of course when you're motoring through a knot, um, the, the knife can tend to shudder some. Uh, it, not necessarily that you might not have the knife tight enough in the head, but it's just the natural tendency that there's stresses on that knife as it's cutting. And you hit a harder or a denser uh, section of that board, the knife kind of shudders and then calms down and keeps running. So the next step of carbide, more for longevity, is the double back. It's a two-piece system. But what we have to watch for is we don't want that shutter to cause problems and possibly fracture the carbide. It's a very, very brittle plate. It's just a compression form of um, small molecules to put this stuff together. So um, if we're running knots, we would suggest using the inlaid carbide because it's going to be a little more forgiving and, and kind of settle itself into hitting those transition points. Where we'd really aim for using the double back type of carbide is not free material. You can still run it with wood, but it was originally designed to run the MDFs, um, be it the re-refined MDF, any kind of a really the man-made composite that's very consistent, such as your cellular PVC, PVSs, um, all of your uh, broad range of MDFs that are out there. So it's a, a knife that's very uh, well versed in the man-made stuff and that's kind of what we want to stick to because we don't want that shuddering vibration to happen on those parts. So it looks like we got a question. Uh, question. Uh, what are you saying is a good size run when you refer to a, a good size run of mold? Um, it, it kind of depends on your production style. If you are a small job shop, um, you're running kind of a just-in-time application, then you know, a decent run, I used to do a lot of trim carpentry, so, you know, we would run amounts for a home, and let's say it's a paint grade surface. Uh, we'd be running maybe some poplar or something like that. Um, a, a decent sized run is about 1,500 to 2,000 feet, okay? Uh, from that, we can make some of the decisions then of what grade is that material that we're gonna be running. Is it paint grade? Is it stain grade? Are there knots? Is it a, a um, you know, a, a FAS or whatever you may be calling it or one or two common. Moisture content too is a question that comes up frequently too. Okay. So, so I hope that answered your question. Just kind of a medium sized run is generally around a 1500 to 2000 foot range. And that's generally what we would say, hey, you know, if you're any more than that, we kind of need to put you in the next knife steel. If you're any less than that, let's go with a cheaper grade, but it may not be a production run for you. It may not become a, a um, stock item for you. So hopefully that helped. Yeah, and again, you know, in this tooling catalog, you know, a lot of this information is in here with these um, approximate lineal footage runs. Mm -hmm. So this is a great tool to look at, go in here, and if you get in this and you see or you don't see what you're looking for, you know, you can call us and we can have a, a better conversation about that. So, yep. Very helpful. So Michael did just speak something, uh, say something about uh, moisture content, and that is super, super important. Um, we can have the best looking lumber in the world, but if it's too wet or too dry, it's going to cause us other issues. Um, too wet can cause fuzzing on the board and then, you know, force us to have to do some sanding afterwards. Um, too dry can actually cause, make the wood too brittle and then the knives are actually ripping or pulling chunks of wood out of it instead of just slicing through the fibers nicely. So yeah, all, all of these questions can come together, but those are the things these guys have to handle in our grinding service all the time. Exactly, and, and a lot of times, you know, it's not a quick answer um, because sometimes we do need to consult with Sean and, and dig into this stuff a little deeper so that we can provide the best possible solution to, you know, whatever scenario our customer has. So it's critical for us to ask these questions. Uh, sometimes it can be a little tedious and maybe a little frustrating sometimes, I think, from our customer standpoint, but, you know, in the end, we're just trying to provide the best possible solution. So that does cover most of our types of knife steel that we sell. Um, I don't know if you can see this or not, but I'll let Michael talk about some of the um, so, services that we offer in the grinding service. You don't just have to call in and buy a freshly ground, finished up knife from us. If, if you don't want to, we can do some pre-hogging for you. I'll let Mike talk about that. Sure, and the way I approach this subject is, you know, the grinding service is kind of the business within the business here at Weinig. 
and we do meet our customers where they're at. So for example, if you have a grinder and you just want to buy acrylic templates, you know, we'd be happy to provide you with acrylic templates. We also um, have steel templates we can provide you. These are cut on a wire EDM machine, so they're extremely accurate. So we can do that. Um, in addition to that, we do offer rough ground and finished ground knives. This knife here, I don't know if you can really pick this up very well, but this is a rough cut knife that was pre-hogged or pre-cut on the water jet. And basically the way we do this is we take that profile and we um, offset the profile about 50 thousandths and we lay that out on the machine and then we cut it at approximately a 25 degree angle so it closely matches the grind angle. Um, we can adjust that for our customers that are jointing so that we can you know, achieve a closer angle so you have to remove less material. And then we also have our finished ground knife, um, which basically we pre-hog probably 90% of our knives on the water jet before we grind them. So, you know, you're not introducing all that heat into the knife when you're, when you're grinding it. So that's a, a benefit as well. So I've heard, Mike, that we could take a, this knife right off the water jet and go to the molder with it. Is that a true statement? That's not a true statement. And that's happened before, believe it or not. <laughs> The other thing that I get a lot is customers will think that, that they can take this knife and throw it in their head and put their CBN wheel on it and finish grind it. Not the case. You absolutely have to still make some roughing passes with that knife, put your side clearance in, those kind of things. Um, but it saves a huge amount of time. As you can imagine, having to hog all that steel out by hand takes a long time. Saves uh, money um, on grinding wheels, less wear and tear on your grinder. But time is the biggest thing with that for my customers. The time to everyone is the most important next to the cost. We all know time is money. That's right. So with this said, um, there's a lot of, of people that will just say, hey, you know what, I'm really busy. Yes, I have a full-time grinder guy. But, you know, instead of asking him to stand in front of the grinder and just go through hogging all this stuff out and taking 20, 30 minutes to do that, um, just have it done on the water jet. You know, you're going to purchase the knife steel anyways, and it's not that much more just to have it um, water jetted out. We have another questions. Uh, what's the lead time for rough ground knives versus finished ground knives? So the lead time on rough ground knives is one to two days from the time that they're approved. Uh, for finished ground knives, it's three to five days. And you know, this, that's based off of, you know, the current uh, status of our schedule and how busy we are. Um, rough ground knives, you know, pretty quick. Um, we can usually, we try to get them out the same day when possible, depending on what time it is. Okay. Hope that answers your question. So, some of you grinder guys out there that stand in front of one of those things all day long, um, I have seen a lot of times, even with training classes or being out on an install or whatever the case may be, that um, when folks are done grinding a knife, there's all kinds of ways that people deburr a tool. And there's a right way and a wrong way. And uh, most of the time, all of the time, what you should do is after the knife is ground, uh, yes, we sell um, honing stones, all kinds of other things, but after that knife is ground, we don't want to just go back and forth seesawing on that burr. It's just going to take too much time to get it off, and you could be damaging these other edges where that stone is running into the end of it as you come on and off of that profile. So the, nap, the proper way to do it is, since we've already changed the molecular structure of that knife steel and created the burr, and then the water has cooled it off, it's easier to just come across, drag that burr up and off of the knife, and it'll just roll off with your finger then. You can see it laying on the edge of the tool. So rather than uh, kind of the old school way of doing it was just to take a chunk of wood that was laying around, guys are picking them up off of the floor, and then just start dragging it along this edge to pull the uh, little wiry edges left from deburring that. So what we do sell instead of just finding a chunk of lumber somewhere is these rubberized graphite sticks. You can see they're very flexible, pliable, a couple different shapes. But what it is is, again, I'm gonna repeat myself, it's rubberized graphite. So when we are finished with deburring that tool, we basically just drag that rubberized graphite right across the edge of our knife, not being aggressive, but it just acts like kind of a small vacuum cleaner and it's pulling all those particles off of the edge of the tool. Because the worst thing that can happen to us is spend a lot of time, make a beautiful knife, get it out to the molder, and nobody clean the burr off of the back side. And the very first thing that happens when it engages that lumber is it rolls the burr back over into the cutting face and we've got a nick in the board before we ever even start production. Very, very frustrating and I'd say time consuming because now we've got to bring it back into the 
to the uh, grinding area, resharpen the tool and go through the whole process. So yeah. very, very nice tool here for you to use. Easy to, to deal with. It, you just, it wears itself out and eventually you just buy another one. And that applies to the all high speed steel yes. with the exception of the coated steel, correct? The coated steel is worth doing as well because again, the base of it is a high speed, uh, M2 high speed steel. So it's pretty soft on the inside and it could create a burr. Okay. And, and that kind of goes into, um, I know we got a question here. I want to finish my sentence real quick. It kind of goes into what types of wheels do we use to cut or what works best with each of these types of knife steels. Question. Uh, going back to the grinding service, uh, so when you say the approval process, yep. can you go through what that means and how long does that take? Sure. So typically, mm -hmm. we'll receive a request via email, fax, phone call. Um, we provide an approval drawing. We have up to 48 hours to supply that drawing. Uh, most of the time it's done faster than that, just relates again to our schedule. So once we get you that drawing and it's approved, then our, our lead time clock starts from the time that drawing is approved. Anything that's approved after 2 p.m., you know, we roll to the next day. All right. Okay. Perfect. Hope that answers the question. So getting back to them, I know I'm going to focus more on some of these guys that may be grinding or have ground and know some of the pains of it. Um, for some of the guys that have a little older grinder, there was a different style of grinder we used for a while, and um, it had a... Uh, a threaded unit where we would index the dresser for dressing the, the vetrified grinding wheels and what that was a problem about is it didn't allow us to do anything about dressing our CBN or our diamond wheels. So what we typically have is for the CBN and diamond wheels is a chrome molly stick and that simply switches in and out from our diamond dresser to the chrome molly stick for doing those uh, CBN and diamond wheels. So they could not actually dress a wheel properly. And um, it was said by some folks that you could use the original diamond that came on the, the grinder to do that dressing on the wheel. You could, but it also chew up your diamond and wear out the wheel prematurely. So what we have to offer for those threaded in units is a kit. Again, it's in your tooling catalog online, but basically you thread your old system out, you thread your new system in, and then that simply allows you to put this chrome molly stick in and then we can simply dress just like we do traditionally with a diamond wheel or a diamond on a vitrified wheel and get those diamond wheels correct get the cbn wheels correct so that we're actually matching the tracing pin as it's going across the template itself so it's very very important and you will notice a huge difference and a lot of times what it would do is kind of People say, well, if I can't dress my CBN wheel, they would try to use a CBN wheel and just wouldn't like it in the end. And uh, that's a bad thing to choose. Because <laughs> that CBN wheel has a much finer grit and produces a much, much nicer edge on the finished product. And I'll speak to that just a little bit because I do get a lot of questions from grindermen that mm -hmm. call us with questions. Um, so a lot of times I will come to Sean with these more technical questions, but dressing mm -hmm. the wheel I mean, can you kind of stress the importance? Because I think that's overlooked sometimes on how important that is to do and um, when to do it. Yeah, it, it's, it's super, super important that anytime we have a grinding wheel, uh, the shape and width of that grinding wheel must match what our tracing pin is. And anytime we deviate from that match, we, have the, we run the risk of either opening up our profile or making the profile too small, and then it doesn't match up what we're looking for on the machine. Uh, a lot of times if a customer's um, shop tolerances are a little bit larger, you know, ten thousandths or more, well, they don't really care about that. It's close enough, let it rip. Um, the more you get into tighter tolerances where you're running components that have to fit together, uh, you're running dowels where the blends have to be correct from, from point to point, we've got to make sure that the wheel size is correct, the radius is dressed correct. So it's very, very important, even when we are dressing just a general vitrified vitrified wheel um, for the hogging process per se. There are two types of diamonds that we do sell. And again, this is in your book. What comes with the grinder standard from the factory is just a very small single point diamond. You probably can't see it from there, but it's just one single point diamond in there. As that wears, that diamond naturally from a point down gets wider and wider until it's just a blunt surface. 
very difficult and you get a whole lot of feedback on the wheel and it's tough to get it to dress. So we do offer a, a backup rather than just having to buy another diamond every time it gets to that point. And it's called a multi-point diamond. And basically there's small chunks of particle in there and that really allows you to dress that vitrified wheel nicely. It's smooth, uh, you get really good feedback of how it's dressing on the wheel and you get good feedback of, of um, uh, you, that you're actually opening the pores better on the wheel. And, and those pores or those crater surfaces, peaks, is what's actually doing the cutting for us with that vitrified wheel. And that's, that's pretty much the same uh, statement for any of the bonded wheels like we use here on the R1000 or what we would use on the R960 as a CBN finishing wheel. We have to make sure that we're keeping all of those pores open to allow the metal to go through them, the coolant to go through them, and keep those surfaces of those, uh, if you think about a crater on the moon, the top end of that crater is what's actually doing the cutting. As that gets more dull and flattens out, it exposes the next crater and on and on through that wheel. So even with the man-made wheels like this for a CBN or a diamond, we also have to use not a dressing stick like a diamond here, but we actually use a cleaning stick. So as the grit of our wheel gets smaller and smaller to make a more fine, fine, sharp grind, we also use these cleaning sticks to plunge into that wheel and pull all the sediment out of it that could be compressed into those, into those craters. So it makes the wheel cut better. Um, a better cutting wheel is a faster cutting wheel and a sharper cutting wheel, which of course translates to getting us through a grind faster. Very good. One other question that I get asked a lot, and there seems there's a lot of opinion on this, but there's really only one right way to do it, is coolant. Yep. So I get calls all the time from uh, grinder men or shops where they want to know how much coolant to use, what is the ratio, and all the different things that come into play that with mm -hmm. that. So um, I forgot to get this out, but if you'll excuse me for just a second. The proper answer to that is yes, there is a value that we should be mixing our coolant to. Whether it's in the 960 itself, um, just kind of in the old days, <clears throat> if we were not using a, a diamond wheels or CBN wheels, things like that, we just kind of felt the, the, the coolant. And you guys that's been out there grinding for a long time, you know what I'm talking about. If it gets too sticky and syrupy, well, we've got too much coolant in, add some water, you know, and so forth. But as we really start to dial in with some of these wheel manufacturers about, you know, how good the wheels are, well, they also have to have good coolant and the mixes have to be correct. So the old school theory was, you know, the only reason we put coolant in is to keep the machine from rusting. And that is not necessarily the case. We have, yes, it is a byproduct of that and it's good for us to keep that from happening. You can see all the exposed metal on this machine. So when the door's down, it's being flooded with coolant. But also, to help keep track of that a little better is, and again, <laughs> I keep referencing the tooling catalog, is what we call a refractometer. This will basically take and give you a percentage of what your coolant to water ratio is and what we need to keep it at. So especially on a machine like this, it's very, very important that we maintain that ratio. So if we, if we know it's important here to protect the wheels and to protect the machine, we need to know that it's important for a traditional 960 grinder as well. So when you get into some place where, you know, South Florida, where it's uh, very, very humid, it's easy for those machines to get very, very rusty. Um, so the, the percentage of coolant might come up a little bit. Uh, someplace up in the Northeast somewhere where it's very cold all the time, you know, we, we've got to keep that water from freezing necessarily. Not everybody gets to have heat in the winter up there. <laughs> so um, I hope that answered that question. But it's very important that we do use some sort of a reference system for this so that we know exactly what that mixture is. So we are protecting the machine and we're protecting the wheels. So um, another thing, if you don't mind, we'll continue a little bit. Uh, everybody, this goes back to the shape of the wheel versus um, let's say our tracing pin. The, the wheel and the pin have to match. We've discussed that, I've said it 25 times so far. <laughs> but um, so, when that happens, we're using these things up. We're running a tracing pin across this plastic edge. It a lot of times kind of acts like a file. So what will happen is this radius edge on our tracing pin can get flattened off. Once that's flattened off, 
it doesn't matter how good we dress our wheel, we're going to cause problems because the, the, the um, <laughs> ratio of pin size to wheel size is incorrect. So what we have, the, the age old problem is that guys will just run a pin till it's dead because the boss won't spend any more money on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, yeah, it happens. It happens. So what we have done, especially for our grinding services, guys are standing in front of those grinders all day long and they'll go through a pin in a matter of a couple of weeks just because they're running all day. So we've done some testing with the local company and um, come up with a couple of really nice solutions of a little bit harder pin. And Mike, if you want to elaborate on this, you've been a little deeper involved with it. But we've also put the radius on both sides. So we're not just using up one side of the pin, having to throw it away. So it's given us a little more longevity because we've got two sides. But there's a, another thing behind the curtain there that's helping us with that. You want to explain that? Yeah. So there's a couple things. Um, we've got the, this treated pin that we started carrying definitely lasts a lot longer. Um, we've tested it in-house quite a bit, and it works really well. And it's also, they're double-sided, um, so that you're essentially getting two pins in one. Mm -hmm. You can flip it. Um, something else that we're still testing and working on um, in-house is we've actually um, created a solid carbide pin. And the carbide pin so far has done fantastic. Um, we've used one for close to a year in the grinding service. A now, year. A year. <laughs> now, obviously, the cost of these things is going to be more than, you know, your standard $40 pin. But once we get some finalized testing done, we'll, you know, probably release this out. Uh, we just want to make sure it's, it's what we hoped it would be. And it turns yeah. out that it seems to yeah. be that way. How long do normal pins normally last? Um, well, I'll let Sean talk about this too, but from my perspective, um, a standard pin, I mean, I've seen my guys wear them out in literally days. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, just they're grinding, you know, 15 knives or 15 sets a day potentially, and they literally would replace these in a couple of days They or they may last a week. Yep. So it, it really just depends. And it depends a lot on the grinder person too, I think too. Some people are a little more heavy handed. You know, everybody's a little different. There's some <laughs> things that come into play there. Um, you know, template material can, I'm sure, I, you know, we only use this green material, but there's a lot of other materials out there. And some customers use the steel. Um, you know, the idea is you want the template, whatever it is, to wear, you know, the, or the pin rather, to wear before the, the material because the pin is a wear item, but you also want them to last. Um, the templates are much cheaper, plastic ones. So if you're using a carbide pan and you wear out these, you know, these are $10 to replace. So it makes sense. Um, another thing, yes, I'll just chime in on that a little bit. Uh, part of the reason answering that question or going with that question is uh, when we get these templates made, um, if you can, you know, just take a jeweler's loop and look at the edge of some of these big radiuses, even like this one right here, you'll notice that because of the way that the, the, uh, template maker runs its bit across here. It's a kind of a stepping uh, motor that's on there. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's making a serrated edge. So it even makes it more abrasive than just the plastic itself. So little tip, uh, anytime you guys have something like that, that's a radius or a, a smooth running radius anywhere, like a big crown mold or something, just gently, I say gently, <laughs> Take a little bit of emery cloth or some fine, fine sandpaper, put it around a stick of some sort so you have something that's constant and just gently go over top. And all we're wanting to do is knock the peaks off of all those little uh, lines or steps that's in there. And that'll help a lot, but it, it won't fix the problem 100%. So again, that's why we're always looking at how do we make our stuff better? How do we make it stronger? How do we make it last longer? Uh, another question. Is the tool life extended when proper coolant uh, is maintained in machines? Tool life? Um, not necessarily tool life as much um, as it does give a better edge on the knife steel itself for the end use out on the mower. Um, what it also does is the more we can flood that area of where the grinding is happening, the more those particles are being taken away from the actual cutting area and therefore it runs cleaner. The wheels last longer, they cut better and, and kind of on down the line there. 
Okay. So anything else, Michael, you got to, um, you want to go over? I think we covered um, all of our knife steel. You mentioned the grain sheet there? Yeah, so we do. Uh, this is um, not available. Um, this portion or this front page actually is in the tooling catalog, but we do have a price list here. If anybody, you know, is interested, um, you know, you can please call um, Wynick and get to the grinding service. Myself or any one of my associates would be happy to discuss any of this information with you. We can review pricing. We can email this to you. Um, we also have some great uh, flat rate shipping charges that we put in place uh, probably almost two years ago that are really beneficial. So if you've got questions or you need more information, we're here to help. Just give us a call. And one last thing on the way out. Uh, we just want to let you guys know. The reason we're putting out these videos is because we are still getting it. Corona is not going to take us down. <laughs> we are still here. And uh, we also are doing live videos for demonstrations. If you guys are interested in equipment, um, just contact Christian Smedberg and we can get that fixed up for you. And, and uh, I hope everybody is staying safe and healthy. Um, question. Is the One more question. Is the tooling catalog free? Uh, and do you offer a, uh, pro, a stock profile catalog? Yes, the tooling catalog is free, um, and we do have a profile catalog um, that we can, a hard copy that we can send out as well. If you're interested and you need that, um, again, give me a call, call the grinding service, and we can ship you the profile catalog as well. Okay, and another question is, uh, will uh, you have a class on the R1000? Uh, a training video type of, yeah, most likely we will, yes. Uh, right now, we're in the heart of doing a lot of grinding on this thing, getting the tools ready for a brand new machine we have in that's a 300 foot a minute machine. So we got to grind up some eight wing tools and I'm letting old Ronda Matt 1000 do it. So all right. thank you very much for your time. Uh, hope you all are staying safe out there and keeping your distance. <laughs> thank you. Till next time.